The title for this morning's sermon is Stewardship, Honoring God with Our Talent. And we've already seen this demonstrated by many brothers and sisters here this morning from the time you pulled into the parking lot and you saw the the parking lot team making sure things kept flowing to the time when you came in the doors here and and the greeters and the ushers welcomed you and made you feel at home and And then when the uh, worship team and the choir and the orchestra and the band kicked in and started playing and singing their hearts out for the Lord, we experienced the blessing of talents used for your glory. And and, and Doug and his crew back there on the sound system making things sound as good as possible. And uh, and the folks uh, upstairs who are making the, the screens work here so we all get informed. And I could just keep going on and on and on. I mean, uh, it's very inspiring. It's very easy to uh, get into this message today because of all those folks. Um, This sermon is the third in a three-part series on stewardship. Pastor Tilden started it off with with an insightful message on managing our treasure, that's our money and possessions, in ways that will truly enrich our lives and the lives of others. And then last week, Pastor Marcus exhorted us to be stewards of our time in ways that draw us closer to God and to one another. And so today I have the privilege privilege of sharing about talent. And as I prepared this message, I realized there's a common theme that runs through all three of these subjects. And that is that our treasure, time, and talent are all gifts from God. If we keep that in mind and honor Him by giving those gifts back to Him, our lives become more and more joyful, meaningful, and fruitful. It's really a win-win-win. So it's important for us today to start our message, though, with a definition of talent that is much broader than the commonly held view of it. Because all too often, talent is seen as something that just a few superstar musicians and athletes and actors have. And I submit to you that my grandma's talent baking the best homemade bread and cherry pies that anybody ever tasted is just as significant to God and certainly to me. (laughs) The truth is we are all talented. When David said in Psalm 139, 13, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, he wasn't just bragging about himself. He was speaking for all of us. I want to say this to anyone who is thinking, I don't have any talent. I don't know who told you that, but it wasn't God. So with all this in mind, how about this for a broader definition? Talent is an ability, a gift, an aptitude, a power, a skill, or an inclination. Also, a knack or flair for doing something. That includes everybody, doesn't it? And when we partner with God, the Holy Spirit breathes a whole new life and direction into our talent with his presence and his power. The Holy Spirit also gives each believer a certain spiritual gift or gifts, such as teaching, serving, and encouraging for the sake of blessing others. There's many of of these gifts And there's a lot of back and forth that goes on about what they all are and who has which one. But let me just say it's enough to know that if you have the heart to reach out, the Holy Spirit's going to awaken that certain gift that he's given you when it's needed. And over time, you're going to realize what it is. Today we're going to explore how to make the most of that talent that God has given us by going to Romans chapter 11, verses 33, through Romans chapter 12, verse 5. And we're going to go there with this statement in mind. Talent is a vehicle God has given each of us for the purposes of communing with him, discovering who we're meant to be, and blessing others. So, again, we're going to be in Romans 11, verse 33, through Romans 12, verse 5. The first three verses are a doxology, which is a short hymn of praise to God. 
In it, he's exalted as sovereign, almighty, all-knowing, and the source of all things. It's a tribute to God for all his mercies described in the first 11 chapters of Romans, which include, of course, giving his son to die for our sins, giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit, and for making us his children. After the doxology, Paul, who's the author of Romans, exhorts us to worship God with our lives, which is our only appropriate response to all his mercies. So let's read this passage. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will for by the grace given me I say to every one of you do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you for just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function so in Christ we though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. When it comes to making the most of our talent, the doxology serves the important purpose of reminding us that we are each just one little piece in God's gigantic jigsaw puzzle, and that only he in all his wisdom sees the big picture and our unique place in it. Verse 36 is especially relevant to our topic for the day. For from him and through him and for him are all things. And that would include us and our talent. To him be the glory forever. In other words, our highest hope for making the most of our talent is to let our creator guide us in using it for his glory and not our own. The rest of our scripture can help us on that journey. So let's look at Romans 12, verse 1, with this statement in mind. Talent is a vehicle God has given each of us for the purpose of communing with him. It reads, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In other words, considering who God is, and how forgiven we are by him. It only makes sense for us to offer our entire being, including our talent, for the purpose of worshiping and communing with him. There's a line from a movie called Chariots of Fire, which is a story about a man of faith who's an athlete, and it speaks to this. When somebody asked him the reason for his running, he said this, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Running was a talent God had given him for the purpose of communing. Let me ask you a question. What is that certain something you do that just feels God breathed and right, like you're meant to do it for his pleasure? I believe my grandma, when she was baking those cherry pies and that homemade bread, was feeling God's pleasure because she loved the Lord. (laughs) She was communing with God right there in her kitchen. To prepare our hearts for those fulfilling moments to happen in our lives, it helps to stay in tune with God by repenting for those times when we've turned our back on Him and by remembering how empty and futile life is without Him. 
I know what I'm talking about. For the, for the first 40 years of my life, I lived without Christ. And I was using my talent for my own purposes. And those were years filled with lots of darkness and heartbreak. I was missing him, and I didn't even know it. So when those temptations come along for us to run off on some worldly wild goose chase, and they do for all of us, we've got to remember what's at stake and choose to stay true to the one who's absolutely faithful and true to us. And that reminds me of a song. I really want to play this for you, too, because uh, it's been helping me stay on track. It's called Be True to the One Who's True to You. I went deep down into darkness time and time again trying to find peace of mind where it's never been and I know long ago I'd have met my end if I hadn't heard these words of wisdom from a faithful friend he said the number one thing for you to do as you're cruising down life's avenues to be true to the one who's true to you when temptations start to rule you got to be true to the one who's true to you then my friend went on he said in this world of trouble filled with twists and turns left to your own devices you're sure to crash and burn so god died to become your guide every step of the way but you keep on straight and narrow you gotta keep the faith the number one thing for you to do as you're cruising down life's avenues, be true to the one who's true to you. When temptations start to brew, you got to be true to the one who's true to you. He said, listen here. God knew just what he was doing when he made you who you are. He charted out a life for you. It's written on your heart. But to become someone he created you to be and keep your appointment with your destiny. Number one thing for you to do You know that that moment when we make that choice is so vital it's so vital for us to to let him have his grace kick in and, and just keep us heading down the road he, he's got for us isn't it and it's and not only that it's just such a relief to be in his will <laughs> so let's move on to Romans 12 verse 2 with this statement in mind 
Talent is a vehicle God has given each of us for the purpose of discovering who we're meant to be. And it reads, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We are being encouraged here to be nonconformists. Not for the sake of using our talents as we see fit, but, but for the sake of using them as God sees fit. In that process of partnering with him, we're changed day by day from the inside out in a deep and meaningful way. And we're able to discover who he created us to be and not who the world wants us to be. But in this process, it's a really good idea to fasten our seatbelts. Because God often takes us places we do not expect to go. He stretches us. He surprises us. I mean, for heaven's sakes, here I am, an old bald white guy, and he had me write a rap song. <laughs> God demolishes our agendas for ourselves and replaces them with his perfect agenda for each of us. We discover what it means to take up our cross daily and follow him, to walk by the faith and hope we have in him and his better way for us, even when it doesn't fit our expectations. If we persevere, it's all for the best. I'd been playing music for a long time, 25 years, uh, when I came to Christ. And I remember at that time when I accepted him as my savior, I was thinking in the back of my mind, it was a little presumptuous, but I was thinking, maybe God will have me open at the Shoreline Amphitheater for some superstar now. And so, you know, I was going along with that thought, and, and God spoke these words into my heart. Rest homes. And I said, God, I think we got a bad connection here. I was thinking of something a little more glamorous. Have you tried to argue with God? Doesn't go well. So each day he would pile another brick on that burden of, of starting to minister in rest homes till finally I, I just said, okay, I got it. And, and uh, my wife Nancy and me and, and our uh, two kids, our, my son and daughter, started going into rest homes and we found a certain one that just felt like the place where we were supposed to be. And we started to experience the blessing of knowing some of the older saints, some of them had known him for 60 or 70 years. And for hearing them sing those old hymns from their gut, just embracing the reality of God's eternal love. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. And as they were preparing to head on into eternity, that's, they were doing that. They were embracing that truth and that reality. I remember especially uh, a woman there named Harriet who um, had diabetes and lost a leg and, and was in a wheelchair, as most of them were. But Harriet loved, loved to worship God. And so every service, she had to be in the front row. And if, she was, if somebody was in her way between getting in the front row, she would run over them with her wheelchair. <laughs> And she would get in that front row and she'd belt out, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, so loud that I thought she was going to break the windows. <laughs> and I loved it. You know, I loved the chance to know Harriet. And, and she uh, had a stroke and it was clear she was about to head on. And we went to visit her and to pray with her. And I remember looking in her eyes and, and what I saw in her eyes was not fear, and there was no despair. What I saw in her eyes was eagerness. And even though she couldn't talk at that point, I felt like she was thinking, Toby, I'm heading for that ultimate front row seat. <laughs> And, and I'm not going to need a wheelchair. I'm going to have two strong legs, and I'm going to be jumping up and down, worshiping God. <laughs> Blessed assurance. 
you don't experience that kind of thing at the Shoreline Amphitheater. <laughs> I'm glad to say, I mean, we, we ministered there for nine years. So each month we'd go there and we just, you know, it was such a rich time. And, but I'm happy to say uh, other, other ALCF members have taken up that ministry. And here it is almost 20 years later and just going strong. Isn't that great? Another blessing from all this was learning all those old hymns prepared me for my mom's last days when um, her mind was failing and she wasn't even quite sure who I was, but she remembered her old hymns. And we'd get together and sing those together and it was, I saw her being comforted and it comforted me, especially to hear her sing and when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. <laughs> she sang that well. About a, a couple of weeks ago, a dear friend of mine, uh, Jim Seawright, who a lot of you know, um, drove me out to the Shoreline Amphitheater because he was the lead paint contractor there who painted the whole building. And um, so Jim persuaded the folks there, there was very few people there, but the staff there, to let us walk around the ground. So I walked out and ended up standing center stage on the, in the, on the main stage there looking out at all the empty seats, you know, and I just kind of had to smile and, and think, well, Lord, you finally got me here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it took a while, and there's only a couple squirrels out there in the audience, but, <laughs> but heck. But I'm so glad that uh, God had me take my musical talent to that rest home because it took me further down the road to where I'm meant to be, and you can't beat that. The adventure that life is with God at the wheel is so much more meaningful than the empty life we lead when we're calling our own shots. And that reminds me of a song. <laughs> I'm going to ask my dear friend Wiley to come up here and help me with this. <laughs> Wiley has the, one of his talents is the talent for playing the harmonica. Let's give Jesus some praise, church. Let's give Jesus some praise. Amen, church. Amen, church. It's called Heading in the Right Direction. find trouble cause I know where it's at just around the bend from doing anything you please on the steep downhill up dead end street you know you've arrived by the lump in your throat and cause everywhere you turn you got nowhere to go nothing left to do hit your knees and pray Lord won't you lead me on your better way and when it does you know it sure feels good you're heading in the right direction Instead of sneaking down an alley Trying to make another shady connection Sky's a limit Far as you can see When you're riding down the road To where you're meant to be Lord, won't you keep me Heading in the right direction Giving you the wheel Cause I need to keep me heading in the right direction. Lord leads in mysterious ways by the reassurance stirring of His purifying grace. Taking us places we could never go alone. Sending us friends to keep us keeping on He lifts us up above our years of fears To the freedom and the peace of his new frontiers You never know it's coming up around the bend It always beats the hell out of the hell we've been in Don't you know it sure feels good When you're heading in the right direction 
down an alley trying to make another shady connection. Sky's a limit, far as you can see when you're riding down the road to where you're meant to be. Lord, won't you keep me heading in the right direction? Giving you the wheel, cause I need you to keep me heading in the right direction. Lord, keep me heading in the right direction, yeah. Keep me heading in the right direction. Jesus be praised, church. Give him glory. Hey, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sky's the limit far as you can see when you're heading down the road to where you're meant to be. That's true, huh? Let's explore Romans 12, verses 3 to 5, with this statement in mind. Talent is a vehicle God has given each of us for the purpose of blessing others. First, in this passage, Paul gives us a warning about a potential roadblock to our blessing others in the way we're meant to, and then he follows that up with a way around that roadblock. It reads this way. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and those members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Paul is warning each of us, don't let the talents and gifts God has given you go to your head. Don't start thinking of yourself as a mighty man of God or a mighty woman of God who can do anything and everything in Jesus' name. From that perspective, we've, we can even get prideful about how humble we are which brings to mind a quote by Golda Meir, the former prime minister of Israel. She said, don't be so humble. You're not that great. <laughs> it's enough and better to think of ourselves as men of a mighty God and women of a mighty God. Then we'll give credit where credit is due and stay in touch with our ongoing need for his guidance. And then he can lead us to bless others in that certain way he created us to be used. Along these lines, Mother Teresa, whose talents were definitely used by God to bless others, had this to say. I don't think there's anyone who needs God's help and grace as much as I do. Sometimes I feel so helpless and weak. I think that is why God uses me. Because I cannot depend on my own strength. I rely on him 24 hours a day. If the day had even more hours, then I would need his help and grace during those hours as well. All of us must cling to God through prayer. The need for humility becomes all the more obvious when we team up to reach out to others. If we think of ourselves as teammates who each have a certain role to play, it can help us to appreciate and encourage each other instead of comparing ourselves to each other and getting critical. Yeah. <laughs> That's such a relief, isn't it? Just to sit back and say, hey, we're all in this together. And, and instead of, hey, I'm a little better than you. <laughs> so that's what Paul was warning us about and talking about when he said, we belong to each other. When I was growing up, um, I have a, a younger brother, great guy named uh, Scotty, Scott. And he was 22 months younger than me. And we both love playing sports. And he was a, he's a really good athlete. 
And so I was always feeling like, you know, he's my younger brother, but I, he's, he's a little bit ahead of me here. I got to beat him. I got to catch up to him. And so there was always this tension between us, and it, it uh, manifested, especially early on, in uh, me beating him up every day. <laughs> now, as he got a little bigger, I stopped doing that. <laughs> but we were still in this competition. And, and I'll never forget uh, the time when we both tried out for the high school varsity basketball team. And the day when the coach posted on the bulletin board the roster for all the guys who made the cut. And so he and I walked up to that bulletin board and I started reading down the list. And I saw my name. And right next to it, I saw his name. And I turned to him and I said, we're on the same team. And it hit me. That, that truth we're just talking about. And, and that was a long time ago, but we have not had a disagreement or an argument since that day. Because we, I realized, you know, we're in this together, and that's true for all of us. Taking the team analogy a step further, as we all listen to our coach, the Holy Spirit, he directs and empowers each of us and all of us together to reach the goal of blessing others. And I can't think of a, a better example of that than the Easter outreach dramas and the Christ, Christmas outreach dramas that take place here. So many people come together with so many different talents and the, and the Holy Spirit blends them all together. And, and out of that comes these amazingly inspiring productions that bless so many people. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. If we ever needed proof of this, and I can tell you a huge, the, the main reason that happens is because before every rehearsal and before each performance, everybody, from the folks who helped build the stage, the, the makeup artists, the, I mean, just everybody involved, they all get together and they worship God together. And then they pray together. And they ask the Holy Spirit to please come and make the most of their talents. And he does. I attended all eight uh, uh, productions for the uh, Easter time, and inevitably, during each one, at some point, somebody would come up to me and they'd say, where did you get these actors and musicians and dancers and singers? Did you fly them up from L.A.? <laughs> and I was happy to be able to say, nope, those are just prayed up ALCF members. <laughs> And it's, but it's so inspiring. And I mean, I, personally, I rededicated my life to Christ at all eight performances. It was just great. You know? I want to say, if you're in the course of this message, if you're feeling stirred, like, you know, I feel like there's, I'd like to explore ways I can use my talent, I want to give you an email address. Uh, just to send an email, and, and uh, a discovery session counselor will give you a call back and arrange an appointment. You can talk things through with them. So here's the email address. It's service, S-E-R-V-I-C-E, -E, at A-L-C-F dot net. And that's... Anyway, in closing, we've talked about how God created us all with talent and that we're all originals. And we've talked about how as we offer our lives to him, he uses the talent he's given us for the purposes of communing with him, discovering who we're meant to be, and blessing others. And when we do that, God makes our lives so much more joyful, meaningful, and fruitful. I mean, really, it's such an honor to honor him with our talents. And the same holds true for time and treasure. So let's just keep letting God guide us in the right direction he has for each of us and all of us together. Amen? Amen. Great.